everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm really excited to see you all here today. We have a great guest and on a vital topic, and we have so much to talk about. Uh, back in the 1980s, the um, American libraries got together and decided before the web launched that there was going to be a challenge to find stuff online. And they launched what they call the information literacy movement. It's been going strong ever since, trying to help people figure out how to sift truth from falsity, uh, the bogus from the right online. There have been many, many projects. I've worked on this off and on in my years. Um, but the leader, from my mind, the guru in this field is Michael Caulfield. He's been doing groundbreaking work in information literacy for years and years. He's been writing fantastic opinion pieces, inventing stuff, winning grants, writing books. He has an incredible, incredible intelligence for helping us figure this out. And I've been hoping to get him on the program for a long time. And my reason for this now is because he has a new book that he co-authored called Verified. If you look at the bottom left of the screen, you can see there's a kind of tan mustard colored button. And click that and you can grab a copy of Verified. But better yet, Let's bring him up on stage. Uh, let's introduce him, and we'll see what we think about information literacy. Greetings, Mike. Hey, Brian. Great to see you, sir. Yeah, good to see you again. Good to see some of the people I know in the comments as well. Oh, you've got a bunch of fans there already. Lee Skeller at the set is especially eager to find you. Um, mm -hmm. All kinds of good people. Um, I, I've got to ask, Mike, first of all, where are you coming from today? Uh, I am in Seattle, Washington. Ah, sunny and warm Seattle, right? Yeah, today it's uh, yeah we had a good run, but it's it's uh it's the it's the rain or mud season now. I understand. I understand. Well, I, I do miss that city's public library, but 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 even more, I I, I miss you, Mike, and I'm glad you're here. Listen, we, we have a tradition on the forum where we ask people to introduce themselves, not in the usual obituary academic way, but describing what they have done. But by talking about what they're going to be working on in the future, so I'm curious, what does 2024 look like for you? What are you? What are the big ideas, the big topics, uh, the big projects you're going to be working on? So uh, a lot of my current work is is monitoring the spread of um, online rumor, uh, particularly mm. around crisis events and um, elections, and uh, that's going to be a big piece of what I'm uh, doing in 2024 as we go into the 2024 election. Um, more uh, in, in, in sort of a broader sense and looking at in the information literacy uh, landscape. Um, I'm, uh, the thing I'm interested in right now is um, uh, looking at critical thinking and how we teach uh, critical thinking. SIFT is a piece of that, like a subset mm -hmm. of that. I think there's sort of a broader uh, way to start rethinking some of the ways that we, we teach critical thinking uh, that line up a little more with how we uh, tend to encounter information. Interesting, interesting. Are, are you focusing at all? I know you have lots of free time. Are, are you focusing at all on disinformation in either the Ukraine war or this week's fight between Hamas and Israel? Yeah, uh, uh, we, we've done both. Um, uh, we actually have a piece uh, coming out about uh, the dominant voices uh, in the um, uh, Israel-Hamas uh, discourse on on, on Twitter, uh, and it should be out um, uh, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, we'll see. Oh, very cool. Well, when that comes out. Let me know. I want to see that. All right. And um, and and when you say we, that sounds like you have a, a an, an army of supporters. What kind? Of, what kind of? Yeah, what kind of it's a, not quite an army of supporters, but uh, I do have um, a, a, a postdoc. Uh, and a graduate student uh, that we're working with um, uh, uh, to produce some of this stuff. Excellent, excellent. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, it sounds, as usual, you're doing very, very important work that we need to know about. And I, I fear the next 12 months will give you plenty of fodder to work on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, I'm, I'm really curious about Verified and um, and what you've discovered both in the writing of it and in the responses to it. I mean, you've been working on, on information literacy and disinformation for a long time. I'm, I'm curious, what surprised you in the writing of it and the research for it? Or also, what surprised you in the reception of it? Uh, what people <laughs> Well, I mean, so so far, I mean, so it comes out for for real on uh, on uh, d uh, November seventeenth. We sent it out to a bunch of people uh, for a review in in, in blurbing. Um, uh, um, as far as the writing of it, 
I mean, it's a book that is really summarizing the the, the work and insights, uh, you know, particularly since um, 2016. So, uh, you know, part of it was to get a lot of stuff that we've been doing in the past down in one place. Um, the the start of the book was actually um, a person I've worked with a lot with this on uh, named Sam Weinberg uh, uh, called me up and said, um, um, you know, I have this idea that it's a, it's a, as you call it a strunk and white guide for the mm. student, right? And mm. There were a lot of books out there that um, talked about the problem of misinformation and sort of outlined it in broad terms. And then there were kind of these very sort of, uh, you know, thick textbooky things that had uh, maybe a chapter or two uh, that dealt with the sort of stuff that we were talking about in SIFT. Actually, there's a lot of textbooks out there now that do have a chapter on SIFT. Um, but um, uh, yeah, we kind of wanted something that was sort of narrowly focused, uh, cheap, and could be used uh, across a lot of uh, across a lot of courses. Uh, and so, so that was that was the impetus for for writing uh, the book. Um, I think. Uh, you know, as we wrote the book, you know, there were, um, uh, I, I guess, a surprise for me. Really, writing the book is is that I think, <laughs> I think, I think we realized how refined the ideas had become. Uh, that is, the the last uh, uh, work I did on this was an open textbook called um, Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers, and that was very early uh, yeah. in the process. And, and there's a lot of things in here that are very similar to what was done in that uh, textbook. Um, but I think we've, we've learned a lot of other stuff in the process um, and uh, that it was kind of exciting to to take a lot of things that really we had only explained in like workshops with faculty and finally have them make their way into print. Those are good findings. Um, those are very, very useful to see, I think. Um, and. I keep hearing these questions that I heard back in the 1990s, um, still being asked by people in academia, by faculty, by deans, by students. You know, how do I, how do I true, how do I tell truth from falsity um, online? Uh, it's, it seems just to be uh, uh, endemic right now. Um, do you do you find uh, institutionally uh, are libraries the the real engine of making this kind of uh, information work on campuses or are faculty picking this up, or is there any other institutional support for for the kind of work that we should know about? Yeah, so I mean, the, the real engines of this, if you if you if you're to map this out, the real the real engines of, of change here um, are librarians and, and people in in first year uh, programs. Or, or hmm. programs. Um, that, that's where a lot of this work is being done. And it's not particularly surprising because that's where this work has been done for a long time. Uh, you know, in, in um, Particularly in libraries, libraries very early on took on the mantle of um, uh, uh, you know as the the, the web became um, a, a thing that students had to navigate. You know, it was libraries that, that really uh, took on that role uh, of educating students about it. Um, and then first year programs, um, uh, you know, very often have uh, you know apart from teaching students writing they're interested in teaching students things like you know how to vet evidence you know and and uh they're interested in uh, some of these uh critical thinking elements and so um those have been the places where we've we've really seen sort of broad adoption and we've got a lot of feedback uh, a lot of feedback, uh, from the folks in those um uh, in those areas of the university very good well if, if any of you in the audience right now are working on information literacy. If you're a librarian teaching information literacy workshops, if you're a faculty member or support staff working on how to teach first year students, this kind of stuff, say so in the chat. It'll be good to know that we have a, a cadre of, of workers. Um, and while people are doing that, Mike, let me just, let me just turn over uh, my podium to the audience uh, because the Future Trends Forum is based entirely on what you all want to do. Uh, we're based on your questions, your comments, your thoughts, and so I'd really like to make sure that we focus on those. Uh, we have a couple of questions already, and I want to start off with uh, one from uh, Kate Herzog, a librarian, and she asked a question about specific technology. To what extent does the rise of AI affect the way we approach fact checking? Yeah, um, so uh, in some ways, um, 
Not much. <laughs> like that's a weird answer that, that people yeah. sometimes don't like hearing. Uh, but it, it actually makes um, a lot of the things we talk about in the book that much more important. So, so the, the, the rise of AI um, uh, makes it more important that you know where things are coming from. Right. So, so if you think about how people judge credibility, one of the things we found in our work is that uh, people who um, you know, get a traditional education uh, in, in how to approach things online, people that kind of use their native instincts, often look for what we call surface uh, features of credibility. Right. Credibility signals that are on the surface. Is it written well? Does it have a scholarly tone? Are there footnotes? Uh, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and AI renders that useless, right? <laughs> because anybody, uh, it used to be uh, that it was relatively hard to write anything in a scholarly tone. Now you can get ChatGPT to do that for you. Now ChatGPT might be writing nonsense, but it's gonna sound very authoritative. And so um, these older signals that we have pushed students towards sometimes uh, of what's the tone? Does it feel you know authoritative? Does it feel scholarly? Uh, these are things which are increasingly uh, already have led people down wrong paths, but but I think it um, I think it, it just gets amplified by AI. The real questions that we look at, and this is really what the book is about, um, is we come back to the question of like who is it from and why are they in a position to know, right? Um, also, you know, are they do they have a history of being careful with the truth? And then um, what do other people in the know? have to say about this? Is there sort of agreement? Is there disagreement? Um, is, is, uh, uh, are people reserving their judgment? And those are the, the sort of two controlling questions when we approach uh, information. And for both of those, um, we've really got to get away from looking at the thing itself. And we've got to, you know, open up that tab, uh, do a couple searches and, and figure out again, who's, who's, this, who's this source? And what have other people said about this issue? That sounds like SIFT to me. That's SIFT, yeah. <laughs> well, well, excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for, for that answer. And Kate, thank you for the great question. Um, by the way, you've got a wonderful play of light, Kate, in, in your avatar that just looks really dramatic and, and, and lovely. Um, hey, speaking of which, if I get a quick question of my own, in my, whatever happened to your uh, check, please? Uh, project that would build an animated GIF of, of sifting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we built that out. And uh, as sometimes happens in these things, um, the the piece of that that was the sort of the, the instructions for how to um, how to check things so that people people knew the check please uh, course um, got a lot of uh, got a lot of traction. Uh, but the um, the graphic we just found that people um just people were really uh really sort of reticent to to produce them people liked sharing them uh these little graphics that showed you how to do the stuff uh but, but people i think have a nervousness uh around this stuff and i think you know and i think it's it, there's a paradox right uh, the power, you know, um, the, uh, what I, I call a, a, a Yates effect, right? That that the uh, people who are, of course, the most careless um, uh, uh, are relatively assured of their powers, right? Are are um, uh, of their righteousness, etc. Uh, and so they share things all over the place, right? Um, but the people that are actually the most careful. Uh, and want to do things the right way are, are often the most reticent to engage. And, and part of the idea of this book um, is not is not just this traditional advice of, you know, think more, share less. I, I don't. I, what I'd actually like to happen is for the people to think that think more to share more. Uh, that's that's what I would like to, to you know to happen. I would like I would like people who read this book to feel like to feel empowered when they see something that maybe a relative or, or, or someone else um, is sharing that is, that is maybe wrong and dangerous, to, to do a couple of these quick techniques, get an answer, uh, and, um, and feel confident enough about, about their abilities uh, that they say, hey, you know, um, 
uh, you know, thanks for sharing this, but I did find this, I did find this other information on it. It looks like the situation is mm. a bit more murky than that. And I, I think that's really part of what the way I see it. It's not, mm. it's not just this sort of, um, Hey, you know, um, stop, stop sharing stupid stuff. It's also about helping people out. It's about making sure that good information gets traction and that's just as important. Mm. Okay. Well, th thank you. Thank you for that. I, I was, I love the idea, and especially that you were targeting celebrities who would share stupid stuff. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really wish, you know, we might, uh, maybe now that the book is out, we might retarget it. Uh, we will have enough of an audience of people. It's it's generally a, a small number of people that issue, uh, you know, try to correct people online. Uh, but they're an influential set. It really does work. And um, uh, it, not for the person you're correcting off, often, uh, mm -hmm. but for other people that are seeing that, who are trying to get a sense of this, a exactly. single person stepping up and saying, hey, uh, I don't think the situation is as clear as that, or this seems to be contradictory information, helps a lot of other people that are looking at that for the first time. And so uh, I do I do hope that we get, uh, I think we got to build the culture first, and then maybe we'll revisit the tools. All right. Well, let's let's work on that culture then, um, uh, friends. Uh, we have all kinds of questions coming in, so please join them. Please uh, ask with your questions. And again, remember we're we're very open to your questions and comments here. So if you want to know more about SIFT, if you'd like to know more about how to build this culture of fact checking, um, if you you know, please the uh, forum is yours. Uh, right now we have a question from our excellent friend Tom Hames in the Houston, Texas area, and he asked a typically deep question. Is the real problem with information literacy the fact that we have too much information but can't see the connections? If we had a better way of, quote, seeing information, would that reduce the problem? So I've looked at a lot of ways to try to visualize uh, information, and, and um, I really haven't seen anything that substantially, I mean, we have our own tools for visualizing the spread and stuff like that. I haven't seen anything that you know substantially improves it that way. However, I, I will say that there's an important point here, which is that the way we're often getting information is sort of in this stream of events, right? That that uh, we hear this thing happened and this thing happened, and then of course people turn that turn that into evidence. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think there is a piece of this that we we have as a culture come to really engage much more in this evidence foraging uh, behavior that we all uh, get into this this sort of evidence collection behavior uh, and we're not often taking the time to consolidate that knowledge and I think that's, that's there's a piece of that question that relates to that 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 uh, information has become for a lot of people sort of an endless stream of often outraging uh, mm -hmm. events uh, and the the point where we go and we sort of zoom out we get the context we understand how that fits into the larger issues mm -hmm. um as news has become a little bit unbundled from from you know the, the events presentation of events have begun unbundled from the presentation of context i, I think a lot of people feel a bit unmoored and i, I think it, it, mm. it kind of gets to that point mm. Mm. well what would that kind of consolidation look like i mean uh what does consolidation look like? I mean, what consolidation looks like is, is at a certain point to stop mainlining the most recent outrageous video mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, put it in context. I'll give you an example that's going on right now. Um, there, you know, there was a, there was a uh, hospital that, that took damage in um, uh, the, the Israel Hamas mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at right now over the past, um, a uh, few days is uh, sort of endless people presenting evidence that it was either Israel or that it was was Hamas from the very minute actually that it happened when actually there was almost no relevant evidence to be had right um, and as it comes at you it, it's just it's just overwhelming and there is a sort of sense that I think we have sort of almost a moralistic sense that just the more information we consume about that the better informed we will be. But, uh, you know, this is a case where, you know, waiting for a bit of better information mm -hmm. uh, is, is probably good. It's a case where if you're just looking at the new thing that people are sharing marked up with a bunch of circles and things like that, mm -hmm. um, 
maybe you want to step back and you want to you want to ask yourself some questions like okay in my ideal world who would i get the who would i get this information from right and, and, and who is going to do their best to put this in context of both the history like you know is this does this make sense in terms of the history is this is this relevant in terms of the history uh in terms of the larger questions of how do we how do we answer a question like this of who is responsible what what are sort of the standards the professional standards for making an assessment of this uh, or am i going to keep mainlining uh these sort of endless videos that kind of whiplash me back and forth and so consolidation is getting the context that allows you to start plugging that evidence into a framework and we often see the evidence first that's the way things happen we make assumptions about it but at some at some point you're going to have to find uh, someone you trust to, to help put, you put that in a larger framework and and i think that's the thing that often is not happening online hmm. what do you what do you sorry I, I i kind of downplayed myself there how do you um what do you think about the the growing emphasis on curators and curation? I mean, uh, Apple does this for their uh, for their music streams, but uh, you know, there's a there's more and more people are using the term more and more often. Is that something that we should try and support? Well, I mean, it's it's a double edged sword. Actually, the the report we have coming out is about a set of people on Twitter uh, who. Um, uh, sort of take all these reports like hearsay news reports and so forth and send them and you know kind of uh, put them out in front of people um but you know if the curator is really just a pass-through mechanism for things right if they're not adding um the the vetting of the information if they're not um saying oh this is where it came from and so forth um then the curation you know cura curation has to be more than that i mean you can kind of think of this if there's any museum people in here museum people often get a little bit uh upset that people call the thing that is you know where people think very carefully about what is included people think about how to present it people think about the information that they add uh to the piece that they add you know is you don't just you know, grab the first 10 paintings and throw them up on the wall, you know, with no labels, right? You, you think about that entire experience uh, for, your, for your audience. And I think very often uh, online curation doesn't look like that. Uh, so, so yes, I think curation could, it can be really important, but we have to understand that the value of curation uh, is in providing the larger context, is in, uh, before you share something, um, if, if someone hasn't sourced it or added a link, you're going to be the person that sources it or adds the link before you share it. And you're, just going to, you're going to do that because that's the ethical thing to do. Um, and, and people need to think about the ways in which uh, they can add value to these things as, as they move. It, we want an internet where as things move through it, they accrue value instead of lose value. And I think because people don't have a lot of these skills or don't feel confident in these skills mm. we, we often have the opposite things add value we add things to value we add value to things as they move through the system yeah i mean that's the that, that was the original vision right uh, you know, if anybody here remembers you know vannevar bush uh, or ted nelson or, you know the, the idea was as things move through the network they accrue value uh from from the work effort and insights of the people they pass through and uh, we, we actually uh, have a, a phenomenon in rumoring that describes what happens on the internet uh, more, which is leveling, which is things things sort of lose the detail and the nuance uh, as they move through the system. And, and that's that's not where we want to be. Mm. Well, that's just a brilliant way of putting it. Um, and I, I, I love the way you're giving us more and more details about this cultural transformation, about how we become different participants in, in all of this. But forgive me, this is me asking questions. I, I, but there are better questions coming from other folks here, and I want to give them a chance. Uh, Chris Aldrich uh, has a really lovely question, speaking of, of metaphors here. Uh, what might better distinguishing between your garden, perhaps more prone to be serious or true, and stream, far more prone to entertainment factoids information? Would that metaphor help in the literacy battle? All right, Chris playing the old hits. Yeah, so for people who don't know, 
the garden in the stream is a, is a reference to a piece I, I wrote uh, quite a, a, a long time ago about two ways of, of thinking about uh, online activity, right? And uh, the stream is sort of this endless stream of events that, that we sort of plunge ourselves into um, and share and, and so forth. And the garden is this idea of information as topology, right? Uh, so uh, if you think about Wiki, Wiki is a very garden uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, approach. Um, and yeah, I mean, he, he's exactly right on that. Uh, you know, people often ask me, well, what happened to your garden in the stream work? Um, and um, um, because, yeah, you know, I've, I've gone into this realm, but it's this work for me is really an extension of that, that early work I was doing, talking about how we get back to a balance between the stream, which is sort of this endless series of events. Which are which are important, right? I mean, we're, we're wired to love news for a reason, right? Um, in in the garden, which is this way of of thinking about consolidation, connections, sort of larger uh, um, larger structures that are are, are more stable uh, over time, um, more contextual. And the truth is that one led to the other. But I feel like my work back in 2013, 2014, uh, with some new technologies, was really exploring like how do we look at um, how do we look at technologies that are not so stream based. I think when 2016 rolled around and we saw just how much people were sort of lost in the stream, um, it just occurred to me then that look the pressing thing at the moment is teaching people how to live in the stream. Uh, you know, in a way that's that, that it's not absolutely confusing and befuddling to them. Uh, and so, so I focused uh, my work, um, I focused my work over the, the past years on like, how, how do you live in the stream without, you know, sort of making stupid, stupid errors? Uh, how do you live in the stream, preserve your, your, your mental health? Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, a piece of that, a piece of that is, you um, piece of that still is is this is this distinction i feel like i feel by zooming out by making sure that we're not just constantly like being led down uh the the path um uh to to respond to every single thing uh, that we're zooming out we're finding context i feel that there is something garden-esque uh, mm. uh about that and um mm. and yeah I, I still i still hope we can come up with technologies that that not only feed people sort of the latest, you know, I told you so, uh, but um, that help people, you know, connect things to, to their larger narratives, to their larger, um, uh, to their larger concerns and, and, and maybe show uh, the relationship of a lot of things that seem a little bit disconnected. Hmm. Well, that, first of all, Clark, thank you for the for the great question. I, I tossed in a link of someone writing about this, uh, writing about uh, Mike's thought. Or Chris, that was a great question. Mike, thank you for that rumination, which um, it's a it's a beautiful metaphor, and I love the way you've updated this um, and updated your thinking about it. Uh, friends, these are more questions coming in, uh, so please uh, feel free to join. Um, we have another one coming from our dear friend John Hollenbeck. Uh, way up in uh, the Wisconsin area. And uh, John asks, it's always left to librarians to do this. They probably don't have the time. Shouldn't truth identification be a core disciplinary priority? Yeah, that's our, that's, well, that's our dream here. Uh, um, uh, I, I, we have benefited so much for li from librarians. Um, but it, it is true that, you, you know, you can't, you know, this is so important and it can't be a one and done, you know, in, in, you know, a library session or two library sessions. Um, it has to be something that, uh, yeah, is is not only in you know a course, but is 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 taught and reinforced in multiple courses. You know, one of the things that we've looked to for a model here uh, is writing across the curriculum mm. and thinking about the ways in which writing across the curriculum uh, sees writing as the entire university's job. And I know sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, some people, some, you know, uh, but we have we have a lot of evidence that uh, when the administration is supportive, uh, when people buy into um, these sorts of things, uh, you can have these, um, you know, these sort of cross course uh, uh, focuses uh, that um, 
that make sure that students are are not getting something and seeing it as oh this is just a module in a course, but are seeing it repeatedly across their experience uh, at the university, um, and and uh, it's getting reinforced in ways that make it really stick. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm glad to hear that, and I, I I support this message too. So John John, as usual, thank you for the good question, and and Mike, these answers are terrific. Um, I, I I know you do a uh, check please uh, course. And it, it feels like we're getting a, an extreme version of that course in just a few minutes here, uh, which is great. Um, Kristen Palmer, uh, who's at Butler University, uh, she has a question which takes us in a different direction, which is terrific. Um, she asks, I appreciate your insights on misinformation. Can you tell us more about missing information, the voices and stories that we don't hear from, e.g. non-Western viewpoints? Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things that we, we did um, uh, um, or I, I did early on uh, was look at a lot of the um, a lot of the literature on uh, epistemology uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as I was formulating that first textbook um, uh, web literacy for student fact checkers and, and and one of the things I was trying to figure out is like how do we deal with this question of knowledge uh, which is um, knowledge is a, is a social production uh, and it's and it's often you know, identified with, with sort of this, this particular sort of institutional production of knowledge, um, which is important, right? The instant understanding the institutions, you know, that produce knowledge and how, how central they are uh, to our intellectual lives. I mean, we're all, we're all here, like most people are from universities. We, we understand the importance of that, right? I, I, we're here because we do. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, so th some of those models um, really filter out important voices. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about quite a lot with the 2016 book, as I chose the language for it, uh, was the issue of um, uh, missing uh, American uh, Indian uh, women and mm -hmm. um, the ways in which um, that story was a was considered a, a, like a rumor among other people because not because it wasn't true not because uh, um, these women were going missing at relatively high rates uh, but because there just was no one in a traditional newsroom that was plugged into those communities right and it wasn't until much later yeah. that uh, places like the new york times uh, you know, and uh, the Washington Post started to take that story seriously. And so part of the thing I, I've been very aware with as we've talked about, as we talked about, uh, you know, fact checking and things like that, uh, is that we have to be open to, um, we have to build an understanding in students that, that yes, the traditional institutions of knowledge are important, but there are, that there are other forms of knowledge. Um, there's, other, there's other ways of thinking and that, that those are relevant uh, to these questions. So uh, a lot of this stuff is that we don't say it explicitly in the book, but for, for example, uh, the choice of the word, uh, the phrase position to know uh, mm -hmm. comes, from epi uh, comes from epistemology, uh, a certain uh, strand of epistemology. And okay. the idea there is, is that we're not, we don't say expert, right? Sometimes we say expert, but we don't, we don't say expert. Expert is a certain type of institutional knowledge. Um, but it, it, it sometimes is not thought of as applying to other people. But a, a person can be in position to know because they're a witness to something. They saw something happen and they're not an expert on it, but they were there, right? They can be in position to know because of their lived experience. Uh, this is a person who has grown up, uh, you know, as a, as a, a, a black trans uh, youth, or this is a person who has fought in a war and understands the experience of fighting in a war. They can be in a position to know based on indigenous, indigenous knowledge. Uh, so, so part of what we're trying to do, we don't always sort of wear that on our sleeve uh, in the book, but we, we've tried um, uh, to think very carefully about the terms we use and the way that those terms, uh, very often fact checking, I hate to say this, but very often, it can be a little bit of an exclusionary affair that, look, there's a set of people, designated a set of people to know the truth and you must go to them. But we, we, we try to present this stuff that's also giving sort of underneath the prose, we're trying to give people, I think, a more nuanced 
understanding of, of what we what we mean when we think about the social production of knowledge. Oh, that's a very very subtle response. Uh, <laughs> that's very I, subtle. Uh, I, I I want I admire uh, just just how deeply you go into into you know the the connection between the trusted sources doing this work of exclusion, um, this negative work of exclusion. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, oh, that's very frustrating. Um, that means, well, that, that uh, fixing that may be part of your culture, your cultural shift. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes it's flipped too, right? So one of the really interesting things when you think about um, uh, epistemology and the, the issue in epistemology called uh, testimony, right? Like mm -hmm. knowing something by someone else saying it. Um, which is which is really the the basis of the work. The book, book work is a book that's really kind of practical skills around this issue of testimony in epistemology, uh, and you have uh, you have people who are in a position to know, and then you have people that are are um, um, uh, you know have a history of being careful with the truth, and then you have this other third thing, which is someone that maybe shares your values, right? Uh, because you, ideally you'd like all these three things. Um, uh, you'd like someone to be careful with the truth, be in a position to know and share your values because th the whole package for you would be someone that knows their stuff, is very careful, and can talk to you about how this stuff relates to the things you care about. That would be our ideal world. One of the problems we hit is very often the people in a position to know are not careful with the truth or, or have incentives to, to lie. Yeah. Um, sometimes the people in a position to know don't share our values. And so we're left sometimes with this issue of, you know, who do, who do we trust? Uh, you know, if we come back to the, the, the conflict that's going on here, um, the the United States right now is probably in, in a in a in a much better position to know uh, what is the truth of that recent bombing than than uh, anybody here in this in this group, and, and certainly. Um, than a lot of journalists. They have access to a wide variety of, of technology, satellite imagery, all this stuff. So they're in an extreme position to know. But then people look at the U.S. and they say, well, does the U.S. have a history of being careful with the truth in these elements? And people remember, well, the Iraq war, not so much, right? Um, and then we say, well, do they share our values? And some people feel um, uh, that that's that's not really clear that that the strong support for Israel might might under, might you know might undermine that right and, and this is a very nuanced situation I'm not uh, coming down um, on, on, a, on a side here with this particular incident but that's the stress point right the stress point is very often the people in a position to know are people that might have uh, might have other incentives the issue though is you've eventually got to trust somebody Right, and so maybe maybe you trade a little bit of them being in a position to know. Maybe the the U.S. is in a strong position to know, but you, you're a little unsure about these other things. Maybe BBC Verify, uh, which I think is really good work. Uh, if you're looking for a source in this conflict, BBC Verify I think has, has been one of the one of the best. Um, uh, uh, maybe BBC Verify is in less of a position to know. But they, they seem to, they match your values more and they um, ha have a history of being careful with truth. And maybe when you average all those things together, that's where you go. But you got to choose something, right? You've got to choose something. Is that the, uh, the link for that is uh, BBC News reality check, right? I think. It's a reality check. Uh, it's the verified team. It should say the BBC verified okay. team. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, the, the link might be reality. I think that might be what they call their stream. Yeah. Okay, their stream, ah, but not their garden, uh, <laughs> or perhaps their their rocks in the stream. Yeah, right. Um, we have uh, um, a whole bunch. Of, the chat box is just on fire. If I can completely trash the elemental nature of this metaphor, uh, we have all kinds of, of comments coming in. Um, but I, I really, I really appreciate that, um, Mike. And uh, I, I think there's there's still more questions coming. Um, and there's one from uh, our good friend on the West Coast, Mark Corbett Wilson. Uh, who you know, ramps up the politics of this, and he asks us to think about critical digital fluency as self-defense in these times of total war and information warfare. Yeah, I mean, so we do deal with this. Uh, we do deal with this, and we've dealt with this uh, quite a while. Um, yeah, a piece of this is just people getting things wrong. A piece of this is sort of traditional rumoring, uh, people trying to make sense in, uh, you know, in ambiguous situations and so forth. 
But a big piece of this is, yeah, there's lots of people out there trying to manipulate you. And, and those can be, um, you know, those can be foreign state actors. Absolutely. Like it's, it, right now, Twitter is, is crawling with that. Um, uh, those can be uh, corporate entities. Uh, you know, I, I um, you know, I, I smoked for a lot longer than I should have smoked, uh, you know, um, uh, before I quit. Uh, you know, partially because, uh, you know, the tobacco companies were feeding everybody research that created just enough, just enough doubt, you know, and it's so, 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 so stupid now, right? But, um, you know, just enough doubt that, well, you know, maybe it's this subset of people that are really, you know, have the product, you know, and so forth. None of it was, you know, if you dug into it, none of it was credible. But for people that want to believe something very often, um, you know, it's just got to have sort of some sort of facial validity, and and uh, and, and that's enough. Uh, that's enough to to deal with your growing cognitive uh, dissonance. So I do think I do think that it's protection. I do think there's a lot of people. People often say, "Well, you know, are you gonna? You know, people believe what they want to believe. Are you gonna change any minds here? People are just really out to prove what they believe, and all of that's true." Um, it, to some extent, but I, th I do think over time, um, I mean, people get, people do get manipulated. People do get manipulated to act and, and, uh, express things and, um, uh, you know, just, just, uh, go through life in ways that do not reflect their values because they've been misinformed about, uh, something or, or because someone's feeding them stuff that allows them to, I think a lot about cognitive dissonance these days. Um, yes, it's true. We all go and we try to find information that supports our, our position. But the nice feature of cognitive dissonance is it's really painful. It's really painful to be in a state of cognitive dissonance. And so you, you in, in a perfect world, New information starts coming in, and in, in the, the, in, as you see that new information, yes, you dismiss some of it and so forth, but it becomes a, a bit of a project to try to maintain a belief in a state of cognitive dissonance. It takes up, starts taking up a lot of your time. And uh, uh, in an ideal world, eventually, that cognitive dissonance becomes so much that you say, you know what? Why am I still holding on to this belief? You know, and and I, I, think, um, I think there is that possibility. I think one of the things that People often talk about misinformation as changing people's beliefs. I actually think it's the opposite. I think misinformation more often allows us to maintain beliefs that we know deep down are not true. But but misinformation is fed to us as as sort of a as sort of a um, you know sort of a, a an analgesic <laughs> against the against the pain of cognitive dissonance that allows us to not sort of face up. To our own inconsistencies, and so I actually, I actually think uh, it's it's not a way people talk about this stuff much. But I actually think that the, one of the core, the core effects of misinformation is that it doesn't it prevents us from living our values because it allows us to live in denial much longer than we otherwise might. Disinformation is an analgesic against cognitive dissonance. Yes, I, that's the best best phrase. I I love that. Um, I, I should have introduced you differently. Like I, I should have said, Mike is the poet of information. <laughs> this is fantastically great. Um, uh, for, thank you so much. I, and we have a we have a um, not a question, but a good example uh, from uh, Laura Geckler at the University of Notre Dame, which I can't help but say is Notre Dame. But check this out. This is really nice. Uh, this 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 is a link uh, to a BBC website or to a BBC article on the web. Uh, which gives an example of that kind of fact checking, and I'll, I'll throw the link in the chat too directly. But um, prominently featured on that page is the big blue BBC Verify button. Yeah, um, so you can see that. Uh, here's the link. I just put that in the chat there. Uh, thank you, Laura. That's that's really helpful. Um, and uh, we have more questions coming in. Uh, we have one from Robin at Buffalo. Robin, tell me if you have any tree leaves left, or if they've all gone down already. Um, uh, but before that, you have a better question to ask, which is, can you make any comparisons between your publication, Web Strategies for Student Fact Checkers, and your recent publication? Yeah, so Web Strategies for uh, Student Fact Checkers um, was uh, very much sort of a collection of techniques. Uh, and 
uh, you know, so it would say, look, here's how you, um, you know, here's how you uh, check for the spread of a news story. Here's how you, here's how you uh, look up uh, the history of an organization, right? So very much a, a collection of techniques like that. Um, over time, we found that a, a much smaller set of techniques generally was more useful. Um, that sort of the wide range of techniques that we taught, most of them didn't stick, but some of them did. And so, so um, uh, Verified actually has a smaller set of techniques uh, than uh, web strategies for student fact checkers, because yeah. the ones that we found were effective over time. So we kind of, I don't know, people have to tell me if we sort of repeat ourselves too much in the book, but we try to, we try to sort of hammer these home in a couple places for a student reading them uh, and just try to show in, in repeated ways how you use a, a smaller tool belt of strategies uh, to deal with it. There's also a second half of the book, which is um, very much about more of these epistemological issues and trying to give students some, some grounding and how to think about uh, how to think about information, how to think about expertise. Uh, we have uh, stuff on thinking through what it means to say there's an expert consensus. Uh, you know, um, uh, we have a, a, a thing that I'm actually quite excited about that talks about how fringe viewpoints are different than minority viewpoints, right? And it mm. defines that uh, in network terms as um, minor minority viewpoints may not be widely adopted, but they 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 attempt to dialogue with the discipline. They attempt to dialogue with the profession, uh, whereas fringe viewpoints are really that. They, they, they exist uh, in a world um, uh, that is not engaged with the profession, is not engaged with the discipline, and has really no desire to convince the discipline or the profession uh, of their views. Uh, and so, so there's, there's some stuff we've thought about quite deeply about how, how do we explain epistemology to students uh, in ways that are just really accessible, uh, using very simple terms, uh, but in ways that we feel really uh, reflect, um, in, in some cases, some quite recent thinking uh, on, on how to think about these issues. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Robin, thank you for, uh, for reaching back in uh, Mike's publications. Um, and uh, and thank you, Mike, for that honest answer, a very clear answer. In the chat, by the way, uh, Laura Geckler is doing a great job of diving into that BBC story, and she's got some criticism. So, okay, uh, <laughs> well, that's good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Take, yeah. Take, a look, take a look at that. Uh, we also have more. I mean, this is great that the questions are coming up, and uh, our friend uh, Christian Palmer from Butler University, speaking of philosophy. Uh, has a question along those lines, which is, what are the impacts of cultural relativism on misinformation? Yeah, so this is a debated issue. Like, to to what extent does, did cultural relativism, you know, uh, um, create, you know, an environment, you know, where, um, uh, you know, where you know uh, facts are devalued or something like that? And I, I think there's not really a, a causative line that I can find there. I know that some people have tried to make that case. Um, there's, a, there's a book of the name is, is, is uh, escaping me. Um, it's named something like Fantasyland or something like that. There's a book that tries to make that case. Um, uh, but I, I, I actually, I don't believe there's sort of a causal uh, route in this. I do think, though, that we haven't really, when it comes to explaining to students what knowledge is, um, you know, in, in, in why we have the systems of knowledge we do and what are some of the strengths and weaknesses. I do think that we haven't really fully engaged with that. I think one of the things the cultural relevance, relativism tried to do was uh, really engage with these issues, you know, of, 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 of how we know things. I, I don't think that students really get a lot of that. And I think there's um, um, some great sorts of things like, uh, you know, standpoint epistemology, uh, mm -hmm. Um, uh, a lot of the um, stuff that I read is, is, is uh, feminist epistemology and feminist uh, uh, theory on, on knowledge production, um, um, I, I think is, 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 can be very informative. Um, and there's, there's a great book uh, by Naomi Oreskes, uh, Why Trust Science? And wow. one of the things that she points out is a lot of that critique of knowledge systems it actually forms a good basis for understanding why we trust 
knowledge systems, right? That the critique, uh, the feminist critique of knowledge systems uh, in the uh, in the 1990s, um, uh, actually, if you look at it, there's a, there's a core in there that is also a set of principles about how we construct should construct knowledge communities, knowledge infrastructure, um, and ultimately it, uh, makes a case for for why we can why we can ultimately say that one system of 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 knowledge, uh, you know, production. Um, let's let's say uh, physicists looking at, um, you know, uh, physicists uh, examining the universe might be better than another system. Let's say uh, flat earthers, um, uh, not the pick on flat earthers, but fl flat earthers trying to prove uh, something or another uh, from you know uh, putting a balloon up into space. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, 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 of things around that. Like, how do, how do you talk about that? But uh, ultimately, it's, it's, uh, really there's, there's an interesting way in which I, I think feminist theory um, uh, is, is an interesting corrective to, to some of these more expansive cultural relativism uh, mm. uh, uh, approaches. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Sorry. That's probably a little too dense. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, well, you should... Read why trust science. I think it's I think it's a good attempt at, at, at pulling together the critique of science uh, in, in the defense of science. Well, thinking about feminist apology, uh, feminist epistemology in the chat, we're seeing um, uh, uh, Gresham Gibbs, thank you, uh, shared a link to uh, Why Trust Science. Uh, we have people talking about how they teach uh, some arguments here about uh, about the sciences. Uh, I would wonder about uh, the replication crisis here. Um, but we're almost completely out of time. Um, and I, I, I wanted to, if I could, jump in with a, a, a kind of future-oriented question. What, what might a college or university look like if they took verify seriously and deeply you know what if they what if they put these questions and principles institutionalizing them at their core so, you know part of the core curriculum for example part of how departments work what might that campus look like after a few years of that work yeah i mean i i think what it would look like if you think about a classroom i think what it would look like is that you as, as a instructor teaching anything in a classroom or, or as as staff doing an activity with students um could at some point where a question is raised in the classroom, say, uh, "Hey, let's 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 do some lateral reading on this. Let's sift this," uh, and the students would know what you're talking about just as much as they would know, uh, you know, if if you if you you said, "Hey, you know, um, uh, let's uh, you know do a turn and talk or something like that," uh, they they would know. Oh, okay, let's let's go and, and and apply these sorts of things, and then it would just be, I think, very fluidly incorporated into the curriculum. In some of the places that we did early stuff, that's that's what happened, right? Uh, there's a interesting thing, that interesting anecdote that I remember from some of our early pilots, where um, uh, one of the instructors um, teaching in uh, uh, Eastern Kentucky, um, you know, very uh, sort of pro-gun students, uh, um, uh, had said something about had said something about guns, and. Um, and the students, and one of the students said, "Well, you know, um, um, you know, uh, we should, we, we should." At the time, it was the we didn't have SIF, but they, they said, "They said we should fact check that." And then, and she and she said, oh, "Yeah, go ahead." And all the students got on. And they did their, you know, she didn't have to show that they all got on. And they did it. And it turned out she was wrong. And of course, um, I think the thing that um, that people miss as they politicize this this environment and say, "Oh, who are you to be the arbiters of truth?" Is, I'll tell you something. Like most instructors, they're over the moon about that. Like the day that your students fact checked you, and 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 did that well, and you turned out to be wrong, that's one of your better teaching days. And so I I would like a world uh, where uh, the, the the students, uh, the teachers feel like at any point when they're talking about any subject, um, that they could turn to the students and say, hey, let's verify that. The students have a set of tools and techniques. Mm. They can use jump on in the classroom, get that done in a couple minutes. Come back and discuss what they found, um, and and if if that was to happen, uh, I think that we'd truly be graduating people uh, prepared uh, for this new information environment that they're going to go out into. What a fantastic vision, uh, Mike! Thank you for sharing that at the at the end of our session here today, and thank you for all of those answers today. 
Um, this is this is just terrific. Um, in, in the chat, you'll see lots of people uh, thanking you and, and praising you. Um, my my last question is where where do we keep up with you and your work? What's the best way? Uh, well, usually I say Twitter. Uh, I'm not sure how long, much longer that's going to be, but I'm I'm at Holden on on Twitter. Um, if if I pull off of Twitter entirely, uh, I'm on a platform called Blue Sky. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just Mike Caulfield uh, um, dot blue sky dot social uh, there. And so um, I would, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you got to wear a bell dance suspenders. Uh, so uh, uh, I would I, maybe maybe if you're interested in what I'm doing, follow me on both in case uh, I detach from Twitter entirely. Well, what kind of man has to wear belt and suspenders? I remember that. A very careful man. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is such, such, not just necessary, but really vital work. Uh, and I'm so glad you're doing it. I'm so glad you took an hour to to share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Bye. Keep it going. Uh, thank you all, friends, for all of your contributions, all of your great questions. Uh, anybody in the chat, I'm going to, I'm going to, try and post these uh, notes to a blog post to come up. So please let me know if you don't want me to. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this stuff, uh, speaking of socials, just use the hashtag FTTE. And here you can find me on Twitter, me on Mastodon, me on Threads, me on Blue Sky, and of course, uh, on my blog, which has a section for information literacy. If you want to look into our previous sessions on libraries, and information literacy, and all of that, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, and you can find them. Uh, looking ahead, we have more sessions coming up on still other topics around the future of education, everything from intermediary organizations to online education, the resistance to change. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can find them. Uh, thank you again once more for all of the contributions, all of these thoughts, all of these comments. Greatly appreciated. I hope you're all doing well. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, things are getting chilly. So those of you up here on this side of the planet, I hope you're staying warm. Uh, we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.